As we go to open God's word together, let's pray and ask him to bless it to us. Let's pray together. Make us to know your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Lead us in your truth and teach us for you our salvation. Lord, you are good and upright. Therefore, you instruct sinners in the way. You lead the humble in what is right and teach the humble his way. Instruct, lead, and teach us by your spirit through your word so that we may see Jesus and hear us for we pray in his name. Amen. Please be seated. And please open God's word with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Our text for this morning is going to be Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 48, Uh, but I'm going to begin our reading at verse 1 of Luke 24 so that we hear uh, Luke's account of the resurrection and what follows. So we'll begin our reading at verse 1 and read through verse 48. So let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. And now our text. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying, that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, 
The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Thus far, the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. Um, If you had the power to go back in time to any event in the Bible, which would you go to? Maybe you've done this exercise before, uh, thought about what event in the Bible would you go back and see if you had the opportunity? Uh, One minister commenting on this passage said that if he could go back to any event in all of the Bible, he would go back to this event. Um, He said, I would choose to travel the gospel road from Jerusalem to Emmaus, walking with two disciples on an Easter afternoon and listening to Jesus explain how everything in the whole Bible is all about him. Um, Certainly we have in Luke's gospel the best Easter sermons ever preached. Um, I hope you weren't coming here expecting to hear the best Easter sermon ever preached. It's not going to happen. I hate to disappoint you right from the outset, but the greatest Easter sermon that's ever been preached is the one that Jesus preached. Um, And his text was the whole scriptures. Um, And he preached to his disciples, and we want to think about this account of that Easter Sunday on that road, and to think about what he talked about, and to think about three major things that we see in this passage. We see the open tomb, we see open scriptures, and we see opened hearts. And we need to reflect on all three on this Easter Sunday. Uh, Open tomb, open scriptures, opened hearts. Uh, We want to think about the open tomb. We find these two disciples making the seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Um, The Sabbath following the Passover was over. And probably like a lot of pilgrims, they're on their way home after one of these major festivals. Um, And on this road, they meet Jesus, although they are kept from recognizing him. He just falls in among them as a fellow traveler um, and asks them what they are talking about. Um, Asks them what they are talking about. And they say, well, we're talking about all, all the events that have gone on, all the interesting things that have happened in Jerusalem in the last few days. Um, and, and Jesus says, well, what has happened? And they kind of stop, and they're sad, and they sort of say to him, have you been living under a rock? Do you really not know what all's been transpiring in these days? I mean, there's been some serious events, and they recount really wonderfully, don't they, all the events that have taken place in verses 19 through 24. They really recount everything that has happened, um, They are shocked that he doesn't know these things because they've all happened so publicly, um, so famously. Everybody knows this. That's kind of their reaction, isn't it? Everybody knows this. How do you not know this? Um, And we should take encouragement from the fact that everybody knows what happened. Right? The disciples that first day, it's not something that happened in secret. It's not something that happened and just a few people knew about it. They can say to this stranger on the road, I can't believe you don't know what happened. Everybody's talking about this. Everybody who's here knows what's going on. Um, And that should be a comfort to us as Christians because these are facts that were well attested in that day. Right? These disciples can run through these facts in verses 19 to 24 and say, everybody knows these things. These shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. 
that the facts surrounding the death of the Lord are not secret or not hard to understand. They're well known. Paul preaching later in the book of Acts, in Acts 26, when King Agrippa is there, when, it, when, when Paul is before Festus, and he's, he's recounting these things, he turns to King Agrippa and says, you know, you know all, the, all these things. I'm not saying anything that's a surprise to you. You know these things that happened because none of these things happened in a corner. Um, he says in Acts 26, 26, For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. None of these things escaped the notice of anybody who was in Jerusalem. That's why these disciples are so shocked there can be someone coming out of Jerusalem who doesn't know. Because these things are so well attested. Lots of people could bear witness of these things that had happened recently, nearby, and publicly. These things did not happen in a corner. And this is important for us because Christianity stands and falls on the basis of facts. Right? There are, there are things that we are called upon to take by faith. Um, but Christianity doesn't rest first and foremost on, on faith, it rests on facts. The fact of the open tomb, the fact of the risen Lord, the fact of everything that happened surrounding His death. And if the facts aren't true, then the Scriptures itself tells us, don't believe this. If the facts are not true, this is not a religion worth believing. Think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 and 19. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Um, our religion rests on facts. Um, and that's why God gives us such great proof of these events such open and obvious testimonies of the facts on which all of Christianity really rests, which are the facts surrounding the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we serve a living Lord. That He has risen from the dead. And that that resurrection was well attested. Now think of how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas, to Peter, and then to the Twelve, and then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me. Paul is saying there are hundreds of us who saw him alive. And of the 500 who all saw him at the same time, you can go talk to a lot of them. They're still alive. Um, this is eyewitness testimony resting on historical facts. And these facts are uncontroverted. And therefore, we can say with confidence with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 21, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man has come also the resurrection of the dead. These are facts witnessed to in history, like all the other facts of history that have been witnessed to. But what this passage reminds us is that the facts are not enough on their own. Um, because these disciples knew all the facts, right? They laid out the case very well. Um, but facts and alone are not enough, even for disciples who want it to be true. Right in, in verse 21, what do they say? We had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped in Him. Uh, these are not skeptics who were looking for reasons to find fault. Uh, these were people who were looking for reasons to believe, who were hoping in Jesus. And it reveals to us that the facts alone are not enough. Even to those who've seen Him and hear Him. It's kind of interesting that we read later on in this text that they disbelieved for joy. It's an interesting expression, isn't it? 
they were, they were so rejoicing that they couldn't believe it. Um, it wasn't enough even just to see and hear him. Um, you needed something else. Uh, they needed Jesus not just to talk about the facts, but to reveal to them the scriptures. Uh, we need not just the facts of the open tomb, but we need the open scriptures. So the facts are explained and rightly understood. Um, because interestingly, Jesus, that when he turns to explain these things to the disciples, he doesn't say, you should have understood them because I explained them to you. Right? It's interesting what he says to them in verses 25 and 26. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that. He could have said all that I have spoken to you. Right? Jesus had explained what was going to happen. Jesus had told them what was going to happen. They, they summarized that for him. But what does he say? No, you're slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That the Bible had testified to all of these things. God had pointed all of these things out to them through his prophets. Um, and what Jesus is explaining to them is the scriptures have been clear about this, but it's not the knowledge that you lack, it's the understanding. You can read what they said, and, it, and it's clear later that the apostles know the Bible fairly well. I mean, how many of us could quote from, you know, Joel and the Psalms to explain the things that have happened to Jesus? You know, they know their Bibles pretty well. Knowledge is not their problem. Understanding is their problem. Really understanding the message of the prophets. And so Jesus goes to the Scriptures and begins to walk his way through the law, the prophets, the writings, and explains to them himself from Scripture. And this has to be the greatest sermon on the Bible that's ever been preached. Um, most of us as preachers have trouble just walking our way through a few verses of Luke 24. I can't, I can't imagine getting up here and say, now turn to your Old Testaments. The text for today is going to be the Old Testament. And I'm going to show you how all of it talks about Jesus. Um, you would all say, well, we better buckle up because this guy's going to talk for a long, long time. Um, it'd be really beyond any of us to be able to do something like this. And it leaves us all saying, we wish we could hear what that sermon sounded like. You know, we, we, we wish we could say, Luke, don't just describe to us what he did. Tell us the sermon. Tell us what he said. Um, don't all of us want, wish we could know what he said, hear how Jesus did this? But I think we can say something of what he did because we know what his purpose was. Right? Look at, look at verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Uh, that's the subject of his sermon. That the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory. Or what he says in verses 46 and 47. Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. We understand something of his purpose to explain the suffering and death of Christ and how he's to be proclaimed in the world. We understand something of his purpose. And we know something of his pattern for preaching because the apostles learned how to preach from Jesus. So whenever we see Peter preaching, we can think that must have been what he learned from Jesus, how Jesus would preach uh, the word of God. Um, and we, so we know Christ's purpose, we know his pattern from the disciples, and we also know the problem, the problem that's stated in verse 21. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We know their problem. They don't really understand redemption. And so we can kind of maybe think about how this sermon would go. And I think it's important for us to think about the key elements to what we would have found there as Jesus opened scriptures. He talks about the need for redemption. That means we have to understand our great enemy that the great enemy of God's people in every generation from the beginning of the Bible to now has been sin. 
our own sins are our greatest enemy, that we need to be redeemed from our sins. Jesus could have gone all the way back to the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. He could have walked his way through all the ways that Israel fell into sin, sinning against God, sinning against their neighbors, the desperate need God's people have always had for redemption, the great enemy that they've always faced ever since the fall. And they could be told by Jesus that the only way to be redeemed from this great enemy is by a great cost. That the Christ would have to come and suffer and die to redeem his people from their sins. The redemption from that great enemy will come at a great cost. The sacrifice of a per- perfect substitute. And Jesus could have walked through the whole Old Testament and how it always was talking about the sacrifice that was needed. The sacrifice that alone could take away sins and all those other sacrifices that couldn't do the job. They were all pointed to the one sacrifice that could do the job. The one perfect sacrifice that would take away sins. But the Christ was the sacrifice that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. It's only this suffering servant who could pay the great cost to redeem us from the great enemy. And that's what makes him the great king. The Christ who's come into the world to save his people from their sins. The one who had always been promised, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, uh, the son of David, the son of God, the one who would come into the world and save his people from their sins. That Christ was this great king that everyone was looking for. The son that Adam and Eve were looking for. The child that Abraham was looking for. The king that David was looking for, knowing that he would call him Lord, as he says in Psalm 110. The one who would rule on the throne of his father David forever. The one that Isaiah talked about, that of the increase of his government and of peace there would be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And why does this great king redeem his people? Uh, For their glory. Right? It's great glory that the king promises to bring. That he suffers and then enters his glory. And he doesn't just enter his glory for himself. He enters his glory for his people. To promise a glorious life for them in the future with him. A life that they will enjoy of eternal joy and blessedness with their king and the redemption that he has accomplished. That the suffering servant comes to die and rise again and go to glory with his people. As Isaiah would go on to say in Isaiah 53, 10 and 11, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days, the will of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. He's the fulfillment of that promise that David looked to in Psalm 16. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. But one more from the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 8, 7, and 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them to dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in faithfulness and in righteousness. So we don't know exactly how Jesus went through these things, but we can say that that's the great story of redemption the great enemy of God's people, from whom they're saved by a great cost, by their great king for great glory. Um, 
We don't know exactly how Jesus worked through it, but we know the message that he lays out here. And it must have been glorious to hear him recount this. But we know that he can open, the, the tomb can be opened, the scriptures can be opened, but until their hearts are opened, they can't really understand it. Um, their hearts have to be opened. That's the final need that everyone has. To see the facts of the open tomb, to hear that explanation, and to have the Lord himself open our hearts to believe it, to trust in it. And that's the final need the disciples have here. We see clearly, don't we, in this passage, that without Christ, ears can't hear. That They can't hear what he says and really understand it. They can't really get that understanding that only, spirit, only the Spirit can bring. Without Him, even their eyes can't see. They can be with Him and talking to Him and not know Him, uh, not recognize Him. And the glory of this passage is that God does not leave them in this state, but that He opens their hearts, that He opens their minds, that they come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And how does He do that? How does he open hearts and minds in this passage to truly know him? Well, the first way he does it is by his presence. Notice that the Lord stays with them till they understand. He carries on with them until they've understood who he is, until they've really heard the truth and seen the truth in Jesus Christ. He opens their hearts and minds by his presence. I also love that he opens their hearts and minds by his prayer. When do the disciples on the, on the Emmaus Road really know him? It's in something as simple as praying for, praying for the lunch. Right? We do that oftentimes in our houses, don't we? Would you like to pray for the lunch? Um, and so he breaks bread and he blesses it. And it's in the prayer that they know him. It's in His blessing the food that they see that this is the Son of God. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. (coughs) Maybe it's from how He's blessed the food in the past. Maybe they recognize it from previous meals with Him. Maybe it's the amazing mystery of what it is to be a resurrected, glorified saint praying to God. It's hard to know what it is that opens them, but it's His prayer that opens their hearts and minds to understand what he's told them. And that's how they reflect on it after he disappears. How could we not have known? Didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? How could we not know that it had to be Jesus preaching this sermon? And he opens their hearts and minds not just by his presence and by his prayer, but by his patience. We are so slow to tumble to things. Isn't it good to be reminded that we have a God who is patient with us and who keeps at it with us until we understand? Um, That's what we needed. We need a God who is patient with us, who stays with us until our hearts and minds understand Him. That He explains Himself to them, leads them through His Word, invites them to touch Him, see Him, to understand these things. He's patient. And he helps them understand by his power that he is the one who opens hearts to believe and opens eyes to see. And the good news is that when he does that, the eyes that have been opened, the hearts that have been opened to understand, they're never closed again. They see him and know him and never forget him. Um, Once Jesus has opened that door, they're able to walk in. And when, they're, when they have their hearts and minds open, they can really receive the blessing that he says to them, peace to you. And these things are as vital to us today as they've ever been. Uh, for God to work this way with his people. Because just like people in every, in every generation, we have that same great need to be saved from our sins. And to know that we can only be saved from our sins by the great cost of what Christ did for us on the cross. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves. 
There's nothing that we can do to be saved. God must do it all. And He has sent His great King to save us. And those who believe in Him enter into the great glory that He has won by His cross and His resurrection. We will enter into that glory if we believe in Him. We will know the glory of being raised from the dead as He has been raised, knowing that eternal life and fellowship that He enjoys with the Father even now. And so if you believe in Jesus Christ, rejoice. Because unless He'd opened your hearts and minds to know Him, you'd have no hope of understanding Him. No hope of seeing that glory. Only the Spirit can make Christ live to us. Um, And if you don't believe in Him, ask Him to open your minds and hearts that you might receive understanding of this truth and enter into His glory. And let us all take comfort in knowing that once Jesus has opened hearts and minds, they can never be closed again. The, uh, The ears that Jesus opens will always hear and listen to His voice. The eyes that He opens will always see Him as He is. The mind that Jesus opens will always understand the redemption that He has done for us. And the heart that He opens will always burn in love and joy for the truth of the gospel. It's a wonderful blessing that God gives His people. That He opens hearts and minds of believers so that He can pour His grace and goodness into us forever. He is risen, and you are witnesses of these things. So rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to His holy name. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you for these great Easter sermons that Jesus preached and the wonderful way that he witnessed to his own resurrection to his disciples. Lord, we know that we can be slow of hearing and dull of heart to believe in the things that you have told us. And we thank you for Christ's presence and his prayers for us, his patience with us and his power. We pray that everyone here would have eyes and hearts opened to the truth of Christ by the work of your spirit, that we would all embrace him by faith and that we would all find life in His name. So Lord, help us to believe in Jesus Christ, to cling to Him, to know that He is risen, and to go out as His witnesses in the world, uh, telling everyone we meet the good news of the glory of Christ. We hear our prayers and receive our thanksgiving, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.